Hello and welcome to another episode of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. This one is dedicated to ethics and emerging technology. My name is Katina Michael and I'm a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and also the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. And I also direct the Center for Society Policy Engineering. Uh, in the SPEC group. And it's my absolute honor today to welcome Professor Rafael Capiro, a philosopher who's currently affiliated with the University of Pretoria. And his talk will generally address the philosophy and ethics of artificial intelligence. And we're hoping today that it'll be very much a conversation. The first hour will be likely Rafael and myself tag teaming about issues in relation to the ethics of AI, the ethics of science and tech and emerging technologies. Raphael is an author of so many incredible books. He's also very generous in his co-editing, the beginning of a new journal, which started many years ago, the IRIE, and has been a rapporteur for so many different topics, particularly in the European Commission, and has written books with a former Pitt Colloquium presenter, Michael Eldred, and of course, Daniel Nagel, Nagel. And we think about topics like digital hoonness, the identity, privacy, and freedom in the cyber world, robotics and ethics, as we said, uh, homo digitalis. And more recently, his book co-edited uh, with Kurt Zabesta, Johann Britz, and Fisher on Nelson Mandela, a reader on information ethics. I'd like to welcome you, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Katina. It's a big pleasure and a big honor for me to be here uh, among uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, I would like to be with you in Australia much uh, better than here, but it's okay. It is uh, the way uh, uh, technology helps us, also information technology and uh, artificial intelligence, just to keep in contact uh, through the distance. Rafael, I'm very touched. Uh... We met in 2010 at the International Symposium on Technology and Society, where you gave a, a, a stirring talk on outcomes uh, of work that you were doing with the European Commission, uh, a group dedicated to looking at ethical aspects of technology and science. In particular, we were intrigued to hear from you on ICT implants in the human body, an opinion piece uh, that was dedicated uh, and was so important uh, in so many ways. It sort of uh, provided a stake in the ground for how we look at um, intrusive technology and understand the ethical issues around these new technologies, emerging technologies of the future. Um, you're a very generous man, and we very much appreciate that you've given up your evening time to be with us. Um, a short biography, Rafael. You were born in 1945 in Montevideo in Uruguay. Yeah. You hold a licentiate in philosophy from the University Dad uh, del Salvador in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And also you received your PhD in philosophy from Dusseldorf University and completed your postdoctoral teaching qualification, your habilitation in practical philosophy from Stuttgart University. And then you taught in a number of places, so many, I can't mention all of them, but uh, a long stint at the Institute of Philosophy at Stuttgart University and then in information management and information ethics at the Stuttgart Media University, both in Germany. For our audience today, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your life. I'm intrigued by your life and I'm intrigued by your journey. I always have been. But how does a young person in Montevideo end up in Germany working on projects in the European Commission and creating such an important contribution. Can you tell us about growing up in Uruguay? Um, well, telling about oneself is a little bit dangerous because uh, you have some kind, kind of uh, uh, egocentric position. Uh, so it's not so un unproblematic. Uh, I wrote a text uh, about uh, my life uh, written in the third person. Uh, which is an interesting way just to avoid some kind of egocentric. And I call this text trans, uh, um, living in translation. 
Uh, and I think this is a little bit what my life has been uh, until now and continues being, uh, not only a translation, translation between uh, languages, but also cultures and different settings uh, and the different worlds you address already in Uruguay and I was a Jesuit for eight years in Argentina and Chile. Uh, so this was an important part of my life too, uh, my heritage also from the philosophical point of view. It was uh, the foundations of uh, what I became later on. Uh, and then uh, when I came to Germany, it was absolutely the contrary. It was the Atomic Research Center in Karlsruhe. Why I came here? Because I wanted to study documentation. Well, I wanted to earn money, just to put it more simply. Uh, I, was, uh, I didn't want to go back to Uruguay to my family. I want to make my life by myself. And so I got a scholarship at the Atomic Research Center in Karlsruhe, which, which was donated by the uh, uh, Atomic Research Energy in Vienna uh, from the United Nations. So it was supposed to be here, uh, I was supposed to be here for two years, and now I'm 50 years. So a long journey until now in Germany and Europe and many other countries, as you said. And um, I think what makes my life some kind of, uh, uh, what I can, I can generalize my life. So just to get out of the contingencies of an individual, it's just uh, the experience of translating. And I think this is a kind of, a, yeah, a universal point of view of, of my life when I think what I have been doing. Well, uh, uh, translating from one culture to the other. So not me, but it's important, my contingency and the events in my life, uh, which are, uh, of course, uh, always uh, yeah, unpredictable and uh, not so important for others, I think. But the experience of uh, translating and the experience of, of, uh, of talking to each other and dialogue, I think, um, this is, I think, the message uh, which I have learned through many, many experiences in many, many countries uh, and facing um, the challenges of not understanding myself or not understanding others or others not understanding me. And this is a hermeneutic experience, of course. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what I think uh, we need in uh, the present moment in which uh, our world is just uh, breaking into pieces, uh, separating each other from, from everything else, uh, physically and ecologically and politically and so on. So what I have learned in my, my particular life uh, is uh, try to, to keep in dialogue and to, um, uh, to let the other ask in me and, uh, and challenge in me. So it's less a, a starting from myself, but starting from the other and facing the other. See, this is the challenge uh, we as humans have, is to put it in a more general way, not only me, it's we as humans uh, facing the other. Uh, the other is, uh, of course, uh, can be <laughs> interpreted in many ways, but I don't want to go now into this. But uh, I think this is the, the experience when, when, we are, when, we come, when we are born, uh, and, uh, and, and facing the other, the mother, the father, the family, and so on, the city in which you are born, the language you learn, and so on. So the experience of the other. Uh, and I think the way we uh, learn to deal with these experiences is basic uh, for the rest of the life uh, when you start in the family. Well, sorry, I, I cannot, uh, if, if, you, <laughs> if you want me to go into deeper details, uh, less uh, the contingency, but more the, uh, the reading of this contingency from uh, the general perspective. So, uh, of course, I can do it, I'm very, very happy to do it. Uh, and these this two kinds of readings is something I learned also from philosophy, particularly from Hegel. Uh, which who always says in the phenomenology of spirit, uh, uh, the, the perspective of the uh, nature uh, uh, conscious. And then when he says we, via, uh, which is the, the absolute spirit, of course, the perspective of the, of, the, of the general, the universal. And so he goes up and down. And so uh, I think this is, uh, I, of course, I'm not a Hegelian. I not, don't believe in, this, in the absolute spirit and absolute knowledge, but I learned from Hegel. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, 
something each of one of us can 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 try to do just to jump into the universal and come back into the particular that that's that's it i think yeah that's beautiful uh, Raphael. and i i will pop in your life translation link in the chat in a moment for people to visit to read more about your incredible upbringing uh and also uh your studies thank you for sharing that online it's very inspiring for us to read and to learn about your journey um tell us when and how you got entangled with the study of technology so you've mentioned to us the culture understanding culture and the other and being understood tell us now how technology came into your life as an area of study well it was very pra practical because uh, i got a scholarship as i told you at the atomic research center at the 70s in the 70s 71 i came to germany so 50 years ago uh, so atomic energy is is what now uh, uh, IT or artificial intelligence is about. Everybody was talking about atomic energy and spending a lot of money uh, about atomic energy. So it was the the zeitgeist, you can say, the, the spirit of the time. It was uh, this technology, uh, and I was in this uh, research center of Karlsruhe, was one of the mo most modern research centers. So. With a lot of physicists and, and, and chemists and so on, all the natural scientists around me and technologists, and all the all the time talking about about energy and energy and energy, atomic energy and so on. So uh, I was supposed to to learn documentation because called at that time. So what Google and Co are doing now, but at that time it was the beginning, as you know, in the seventies. Um, and so, uh, so searching with keywords was some experience. Wow, uh, you just could sit in the front of the computer and it, you write three or four uh, keywords, and the search are done in Japan or in, in the United States. And so, you get the results. Uh, and this is the bibliographic results, it was the bibliographic database at that time. Uh, and the reason why it was so important was uh, the Cold War, uh, because uh, there was a um, a database built in Vienna by the Atomic Research Energy Center, uh, which is called INIS, International, uh, uh, International Network of Information of uh, um, uh, ah, my, my, <laughs> my English is a problem. Uh, nuclear, nuclear Information Center, exactly, mm -hmm. system, information system, INIS. And, uh, why it was created uh, a bibliographic database by the United Nations, uh, which is not so normally would you would say this should be done by universities or research centers, but not by, by the UN. And the reason was political because it was a Sputnik shock and the Americans uh, perceived that they didn't know what they were, physicists were searching in, 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 in particularly in, in, in the Soviet Union. And so it was just to open the door to get information from the uh, from beyond, from beyond the the, the wall uh, in Europe, the separation between East and Western Europe, and so to invite them to contribute to this database. And this was one of the first international databases at all. So uh, it's very interesting because it is it was not really it, it, of course it was science, but it was political the interest. And uh, it was the first uh, experiences to, to create uh, big databases and, and make searches around the continents and so on, between the continents and so on. Uh, and uh, so for me, it was really uh, interesting also because I'm I get in contact with a lot of people from different countries. Because the uh, UN, as you know, I don't know how many country, countries participated at this at that time. And so we got a lot of uh, visits uh, in Karlsruhe from different countries and so on, from China and, and of course from Russia and so on and so on. So uh, this was the beginning, uh, but the beginning is not so different from what happened 40 years later when you now do searches with Google or whatever. And this is what I see uh, uh, now. And also artificial intelligence, although it was, uh, it was also starting the, the, the discussion about this, but it was an academic discussion at that time. Uh, we, we, we spoke a lot about, you know, how kind of 
image of the humans you can get with artificial intelligence and you know robotics and science of LEM and you know all these discussions about uh, whether computers can think or not and you know. uh, so um, uh, it was but it was inside uh, the, the, the academic world this discussion and what I see the difference now uh, is that this is a social discussion, a social and economic and political discussion. This makes a big difference when we talk about artificial intelligence now and when we talk about it 40 years ago. Sometimes it's like equivocal, sometimes. I think we are talking about different things. See, we think we talk about the same, but when we talk about ethics of artificial intelligence 40 years ago, it is not the same as when we talk about the presentation ethics now. That's my experience at the moment. As you progress and you saw the changes and the types of discussions, I mean, you've mentioned culture, you've mentioned politics, you mentioned power, um, discussions changing to more of a social uh, and societal level. What have you seen in terms of the impact of technology? Uh, you mean at the impact in all these years or, or now? If you can uh, um, address both. So the impact over all this time and then today, what are we seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the beginning was an impact within the, uh, the science community. Uh, when we started creating databases, bibliographic databases and so on other kinds of databases, it was a problem how we can communicate communicate better, better between scientists and scientific communities. Uh, and this changed dramatically in the 90s with the invention of the internet. Uh, uh, in a few years, it was, a, it was a social event and everybody could do the same and, and, and communicate and so on. Uh, and this was a sharp historical cut, I think, uh, the invention of the internet in the 90s. And it opened all these uh, technologies which were created before uh, to, the, to the public. Yeah. And I think this is the, uh, the beginning of you know, called information society and so on. But it was uh, in the 80s. It was not uh, until uh, the inter internet was created, invented. Um, and, uh, and then the, if we think about the impact on society, uh, at the, the first First years were not so much um, concerned with ethical issues. So legal issues, yes, but less concerned with ethical issues. Although people like Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, all in the 70s, raised the questions uh, dealing with computer ethics at that time. Uh, and uh, Weizenbaum was very active also in Europe when he came back from the United States and lived several years uh, in, in Germany. Uh, but uh, again, it was in the 80s still more uh, uh, an academic discussion, uh, what computers can do, and uh, machines who think, you know, all these famous titles of books and people and so on. Uh, and so, uh, but for us uh, as uh, students and, uh, and uh, academics, it was, uh, was fascinating to, to deal with these issues. I remember a famous conference uh, uh, organized by um, Christiane Floyd. Uh, who was the first uh, woman in, in, in informatics in Germany in uh, Hamburg University, and then he taught a lot of time in in uh, Berlin, and he organized a fantastic conference on uh, constructivism and constructing reality and so on and ethical issues. And uh, it was for me one of the best conferences I've ever uh, had the privilege to participate, and many famous uh, inf informaticians and computer scientists were there. So, uh, but again, it was academic discussion. It was fantastic for us academics to just to think about all these things and so on, and how uh, if matter matters or not, when, when you create a, a, a robot, we want, we want to be think, think like we think, no, no, it depends on the matter of the robot. Uh, if robot says I'm thirsty, but he's not, not this kind of matter we have, then don't believe him or her or, her or whatever. So, um, uh, so these kind of discussions were, were fantastic. Also uh, moved by, by important books uh, like, uh, um, I'm thinking about, um, 
Oh, my 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 memory is at the moment cut. So, uh, but uh, but you know all these uh, famous uh, authors at the time, the eighties and nineties, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it exploded, uh, and everybody started dealing with this uh, independently if you are a computer scientist or not, uh, and the politicians. And you hear now we have now uh, at the moment uh, we we are participating at the national elections in Germany. And the first word the politicians talk about is artificial intelligence. Well, it's strange. <laughs> uh, of course, it is it's an important issue, but it is new. Uh, and because of the impact is in all levels of society. Uh, and you say, OK, uh, it was also 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but the country needs a push in this direction now. And so it is a political. Uh, so, uh, but when we, when I look back to the 70s, uh, many of the issues we I, I hear about that were discussed at the seven, in the 70s and the 80s in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very deep way. Yeah. Raphael, what are the new challenges that we have identified today uh, with respect to these emerging technologies? What are the new ethical concerns? Are they the same as it was, but just more impactful today? because more is possible through new innovations? Or are there really different ethical challenges that we're facing? Well, compared with the 70s, it was a difference because of the social impact uh, in, the, in everyday life, in, uh, just in, in the family, in schools, uh, you know, uh, and uh, with, 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 with the cell phones uh, and, uh, and all kind of processes are being uh, managed by artificial intelligence, as we call it, to use this word, but of course, the programs uh, <clears throat> and interconnected and so on uh, between each other. And so this creates a, a kind of feeling that things are going to get better and easier. But at the same time, uh, the issue of uh, surveillance and surveillance, as you call it, uh, you created this word, fantastic word, uh, is becoming more and more important, uh, also in politics and, uh, and the economy and so on. Um, so uh, the challenge is uh, how far can we uh, let uh, artificial intelligence, which is then the programs we create, um, do things that we normally do by ourselves with uh, freedom of choices. It's a similar way as the one stated by Dreyfus in the 70s, similar way, but uh, different now because it is uh, uh, is the bigger impact and, uh, and the economists and the economy itself and politics are very scared sometimes about what is possible and what they don't manage and they don't have the power about that. Uh, particularly in time of elections and so on. So um, it is a strange world uh, and it's beginning uh, uh, now in a little bit chaotic way. Uh, we have no kind of um, universal um, rules uh, of uh, well-doing and uh, well-living. Uh, we, we have a lot of declaration about this. It's okay uh, from UN and UNESCO. So a lot of declaration. Everybody's writing declarations about ethics of AI and writing nice texts and so on. Um, but the problem is uh, is more concrete. Uh, who owns all these issues, all these uh, programs, all these companies? Uh, to just to put an example. Uh, you know, communication is uh, the basis of society, of course. But we have big companies, I will not name any of them now, yes. uh, who are private companies uh, worldwide. And so uh, the problem is uh, if you can run a society, free society, a democratic society, with uh, communication in the hands of private companies, uh, I think it, is, it won't work. Uh, also, it won't work just with laws. Uh, it is like uh, having streets and, 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 and other ways of communicating in private hands. If you go out of your house and, and the street is private, yeah, uh, it won't work for the, for the places and, the, and so on. So we have to become aware that communication is a social good and uh, and what run went wrong i think the last years 
he said we will in, in our college uh, capitalist and uh, um, liberal society uh, we just thought it can be done by the private by the private uh, sector in partly it can be done by the private sector but it is too strong uh, also worldwide and i think this is for me one of the biggest challenges for democratic societies how to create spaces public spaces uh, in the digital era which are digital spaces not run by private companies this is the way i can i can put it yeah rafael where do you see us going in the next period of time whatever time period into the future if we keep on this trajectory that we're on give us a, a a description of the world we might live in if we progress down the path that we seem to be on at the moment mm, may i ask you to formulate it a little bit a little bit longer maybe maybe just so they can understand better what you yes. what, what, yeah. you have described for us um the basis of in the 1970s of all of this work around atomic energy and energy and then the change that's occurred the impact of the internet robotics artificial intelligence as we see it today the impact on society um the closed environment behind the paywall as opposed to the open sort of democratic approach where ownership is by the people perhaps where citizenry and uh, the publics have an injection of, 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 of their voice. If we continue, particularly in the current challenges of a pandemic, to normalize this kind of technological adoption, uh, where, what kind of picture could you paint for us about where mm, we might be in 10 to 20 years, maybe? Mm, mm, very difficult to say. When I look back at my time, uh, what I thought was possible in the 70s, it had nothing to do with what happened later, uh, 20 years later, nothing to do. Yes. We never imagined that two computers could communi communicate from person to person, personal computers at that time would be possible. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this combined with the pandemic uh, and the issues of the pandemic, political issues of the pandemic, the power of the state to stop uh, basic uh, uh, laws of uh, free society, you know? Uh, so to, uh, not a lot of people to do this and do that and so on and so on. Uh, it's sometimes as a format of, of uh, a non-democratic society, but it is still under democratic uh, uh, basis. Uh, and what I see in this crisis is that uh, nature is uh, 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 sending us messages. Uh, you know, the ecology movement is a little bit older than, than just two years ago. It is old, 30, 40 years ago. But we didn't believe it so much what uh, those people were saying uh, at, the, at the time when the green parties were created. But now it's not just about the green parties, it's the earth itself, which has, uh, and, and the viruses, of course. Um, and, the, and, the, and the complexity of the globalization of, of mobility. So it is a very, very complex situation in which uh, we must uh, live with, I put it like this, with, live with nature, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a good word. Uh, we have forgotten nature. I think this is a problem. Uh, too much oriented for technology and, uh, and, and the digital. Uh, and uh, which is fine. I like the digital and I enjoy it, uh, speaking to other people now in this uh, arena. But, uh, but nature is very strong and the earth is the only earth we have. So um, how we, can we combine technology and ecology? I think this is, this is the challenge, basic challenge of the next generation, generation today, because what is happening now the earth is uh, exploding. Every day we hear about you know floods and, and fires and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, how can we how can we meet these challenges? Uh, also with the help of computer technology. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, um, from a philosophical point of view, 
uh, if we try to understand the time in which we live, we live, you and me and so on. Uh, and uh, I put as a horizon of understanding, I would say uh, hermeneutic terms, the digital. It is too small uh, because the digital is a, pers a perspective of, of nature of ourselves too, but it is not the complete perspective. So maybe if we can, we're able to change the horizon of understanding and let, for instance, uh, from time to time, uh, let uh, uh, nature, physics, as the Greek call it, uh, or the, the earth, uh, be the horizon of understanding of our society and not the digital. Or I could put it another way, the digital is just one perspective for understanding ourselves, but not the whole thing. Uh, that, that would be, uh, if we're able to manage this, just to, in some way to relativize the absoluteness of the digital, which is, which is now, I think, uh, uh, more and more uh, taking place in our societies with very good uh, in, impact. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, it is important for, 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 for everything. But um, uh, maybe I can put it in another way. It is not to knowledge itself, it is the belief, almost a religious belief in technology, which is problematic. I think this is, this is a problem. Also because in, in uh, secular societies, uh, there is a void um, concerning the religion. Although religions are very important in the world, but in secular societies, um, it, it doesn't uh, take the role uh, it took in, in, our, in other ages. So um, uh, if we put our faith too strongly, in, in science and technology, and that it becomes a kind, some kind of, of as that's religion, then it's not good. Then it's not good. Uh, of course, we have to we have to use all kind of uh, vaccines, and and it was fantastic for the science to create it with a vaccine against COVID. Uh, and uh, and sometimes we should uh, strong uh, make st stronger the belief in vaccines. So that people really get vaccinated. Okay, uh, I am not uh, arguing against uh, science or against technology and so on. It is just uh, again the spirit of time uh, and uh, how to take a distance, not from science and technology itself, but from the face in science and technology. It's just something kind of uh, uh, yeah, can I say, um, irrational perspective on that. Something that uh, the Frankfurt School in Germany uh, spoke about many years ago, Adorno and so on, on the, uh, on the genus phase uh, of, uh, of the of Clairon, of the um, uh, Enlightenment. So we live in an age of digital enlightenment. Yes, uh, I think it is right, as Kant would say. Uh, it, is a, it is not an enlightened age, digital age, it is the age of digital enlightenment. Uh, and so uh, the challenge is how, how do we live, want to live uh, and become and stay free persons in this age? At the time of Kant, it was of course another situation because it was Newton. And Newton, uh, and, and the whole issue was that if you, pay, if you believe in, uh, in nature, uh, as a field of uh, uh, where causes and, and, and uh, determinism uh, reigns, then is no space for freedom. This was a challenge Kant was facing. Where is freedom in the Newton world? And my 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 question is: Where is freedom in the digital world? It's a similar similar situation, but we cannot repeat Kant because Kant had no idea of computers at that time. Of course, uh, it was the challenge was Newton and determinism, uh, and so uh, I think we need a, a, a deep philosophical discussion on these issues. Yeah. Raphael, you said to us a moment ago that we have forgotten nature. Have we forgotten the self? Um, the self, yeah. <laughs> uh, the self is um, uh, it's not the I, it's not the ego. It is the self with others. 
uh, we are a self with others. Yeah. Uh, and Aaron said, uh, truth is possible only between two, at least between two. Uh, there's no truth between our ego. So the self in this sense is the self that create, is cre being created uh, uh, facing the other. So this is also main main uh, insight of, of Hegel and other persons also think about Levinas, for instance. Um, and so, uh, yes, uh, the question is, how do we have this uh, experience of the self, the social self, uh, in the digital age? Again, uh, the horizon of the digital age, the impact of the digital age, uh, and we see it everyday life in schools, in the families and so on, that people are becoming more and more isolated uh, with communication technology. This is very strange. Uh, you, you, you went walking around here the corner and I saw seven or eight young persons, people, all of them looking at the cell phone. They were not talking to each other, they were just uh, looking at the cell phone. It's okay, it's, maybe it's fine, I don't want uh, to say it is, it is uh, completely wrong, but it's just what you see when you go out of the house and, and you see the people all the time with the cell phones. It's a kind of addiction. Yeah. And maybe we need um, uh, a very detailed analysis of uh, different kinds of addictions in the digital age and different kinds of wrongdoings and well-doings, uh, uh, some kind of different view of medicine and, uh, and medical perspective on ourselves and our bodies, uh, which it is not just a question of ethics. Huh? It is broader than that and deeper than that. It's, uh, so, but I, it's an anthropological question. It is an ontological question also, what things are, what we believe things are, and so on. It's a political question too, yeah. Raphael, um, say we progress down a, a path where we invite technology, not just lugged around where I carry the devices, but I also wear the devices on my body or in my apparel, on my necklace, and perhaps I invite that technology because of medical requirements, a heart pacemaker, or by choice for entertainment or ease of access. Yeah. And we start to invite technology into the body. Do you see the question, are there limits to what we can do with technology as a viable question, mm. as an ethicist and as a philosopher, or do you think the world always thinks that limits are negative? Tell us about limits. Do they exist? Should they exist? Should they? Yeah. Of course, there are always limits for everything. Yeah. So it's not one example. Uh, but uh, I remember the discussion we had in Wollongong at that time. Uh, there was a, a guy from the United States who, who was wearing uh, an IT device. Uh, in, in, in his body, in his hand, so that he could open the door of the garage in the United States without a key. Uh, and it was very new at that time. Uh, and we, we wrote, uh, when I was working at the European Group on Ethics uh, at the, in, in, in Brussels, Brussels um, we wrote uh, an opinion about uh, ICT in the digital body, uh, ICT in the body, uh, uh, the limits and so on. And uh, one of the issues we discussed at that time, but it was 10 years ago, is if you have the possibility that other people have a connection to the ICT device in your body, not on your body, in your body, um, uh, is it fine for you? Is it fine for society that everybody can hack your ICT device in your body also with other devices that become now ICT devices, but not until now that. Uh, and uh, we discuss uh, very deeply all these issues and also saw the, the, where to draw the line concerning when do you need uh, a legal uh, permission to do different things that you normally shouldn't do it because it is too dangerous for you and for society. And so uh, we, we discuss this also from the perspective of the, of the ground law uh, of a society. Uh, so, uh, and um, I, I remember that we, we, some of us were a little bit uncomfortable 
giving too much power to the to the law. But other people said if we don't let the law intervene in, in specific situations, then we will have a chaos uh, in which everybody will have access to everybody and so on. So uh, it was also the, the question of uh, ICT devices in your body and on your body. And the issue was, as far as I remember, also a question of natural sciences, as far as uh, the signals coming to the ICT devices in your body can destroy, destroy your body when you come in and come out. And some people said at that time, this is a limit uh, of, of the physical and the, and, the, and, the, and the body itself, because if it is just a couple of meters, it will work, but if it goes for a longer distance, it will destroy your body. And, and they said, this is a physical law, so forget it, <laughs> okay, because it will destroy it. So, so we had very, very interesting discussions about this, uh, but it was a little bit theoretical, but at that time, uh, it was not possible to imagine what is possible now. And maybe uh, what is possible now is let, uh, less the digital devices in your body than on your body. And this is what we said with this, with this issue. We have it all the time. Uh, and so people say, oh, don't worry, you can throw it away or forget it at home and so on and so on. And so it makes it easier uh, to just to forget uh, the issues of surveillance because it is not in your body. But I suppose that uh, medical doctors are very interested in having access, uh, digital access, online access to, to different kinds of uh, devices that they implant in your body. Maybe with good reasons, maybe good re also from the psychological point of view. Uh, you, you know, these kind of devices when people are left from the, from the jail and, and they use, they should use a kind of device on their body, not in their body. Maybe they should use it in their body, but then you have the question of the legal aspect because it goes into the liberty and freedom of a person. So I think there's a huge uh, uh, perspective to discuss from the legal and the ethical and the political point of view, uh, but also, also from the economic point of view. And uh, we're creating different kinds of groups of society of people who, who will be willing uh, to pay for this and people who are not willing to pay for this and so on. We'll just also with regard now to the, to the ecological crisis, I can imagine that would be also for regard to COVID. You know? Uh, that all these issues will come up in the next years like an explosion uh, with different kinds of devices. The industry is going to create everything on that. Uh, so I see this is a challenge of uh, information ethics, I think, in the next years. Yeah. You participated between 1998 and 2004 in the EGE, uh, looking at ethical aspects uh, in science and tech, and some of the opinion pieces were on human tissue banking, human embryos, healthcare in the information society, doping in sport, human stem cell research and use, yeah. patenting inventions involving human stem cells, yeah. clinical research in developing countries, genetic testing in the workplace, cord blood stem cell banks, and of yeah. course the ones that we just mentioned on ICT implants in the human body. And you did this more than 15 years ago, in fact, 20 years ago. <laughs> And yeah. I find that remarkable uh, in the yeah. group of uh, ethicists and other applied persons in practice. Um, what do you think some of the areas to study for the next 10 to 20 years might be, Raphael? Is it more of this or is it different? Mm. Uh, if you don't just reduce this question to this specific uh, group, which is uh, now changed a little bit, but it's still there in the DGE in, in Brussels. But for other groups, uh, also uh, political bodies, uh, not only the academia. So we have to make a difference between the working, working uh, these kind of questions in the academia, where you have more or less uh, freedom to think what you want and to write what you want and so on, with limits. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, some limits also in the academia. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, legal limits and so on. So you don't, you are not allowed to speak whatever you want. In principle, you can do it, but you have to do it in a very specific way. Okay. Uh, but if you do it in a in a political body, uh, this was my experience in Brussels. 
then you have the framework of this political body uh, around you. So the same sentence that you say in a seminar in the university is not the same sentence as you say when you, when you say it in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a group, in a political body, uh, advising the politicians and, and so on. So uh, this means that uh, many issues that can be, uh, can be doing research in the academia which are much broader and, and, and long, long, long range issues because uh, you have no, no constraints now in the academia. So we have to solve immediately this problem, of course. But uh, in the political body, they want solutions for, for problems which are now there. Uh, and so um, the, the issues are contingent. They're changing very quickly. Uh, also because the industry is creating uh, new, new devices all the time and, and so on. Also uh, in the field of artificial intelligence and, and new software and so on and so on. What is possible, what is not possible now in, in, in one year, it is possible again. So uh, to answer your question, I think this, this we have to open our eyes uh, to what's going on in the industry, um, to who is doing what for whom or not who is being excluded implicitly or explicitly. These are the ethical issues. What kind of, uh, I, I, what I said in the, in the book about Mandela, of uh, heterotopian spaces. Uh, heterotopian, I, I mean spaces like the jail, which is a closed world with own rules and so on, which was a Roman island in the case of, uh, of Mandela, 27 years living there in this closed space. And it was the apartheid state of South Africa, which is also a heterotopian state. So uh, maybe in our society, we have to be very careful not to create close worlds uh, with own rules, uh, because uh, this, will, this will dismantle and, and explode the whole society. And I see now at the moment, with the many uh, impact of, uh, of world wars and people coming from different countries and so on, immigrations, um, it is really uh, a difficult issue how our free societies, democratic society, will deal with all these issues, because many people will say, "No, we stay in a you know a close, close world, cultural world, partly, and we are not going to adapt to a new society where we live in." Uh, and this is, a, I think, a challenge at least for European countries at the moment. Uh, we have one million people coming from migration. Uh, you, you remember that Angela Merkel uh, opened the, the doors uh, to get immigration, one million people. And she, and she said, I think we can do it. Ich glaube, wir schaffen es, she said. And indeed, we, we, we did a lot of work for that, but it is not completed. And I think it's not only a problem of Germany. You could in France, look in France and in England and other countries too, uh, outside Europe, of course, also in your country, uh, in Australia and so on. And, uh, and the issue is how will all this belong together also with the using the, 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 the media, the uh, ICT media. I have no idea, really, I have no idea. And uh, I think this should be done uh, in political bodies uh, and in the academia and also in everyday life, of course, in schools and research and universities, yes. yes. This leads to my next question on the turbulent environment we live in, the complex environment, the entangled and meshed environment, this uh, hiddenness in our current practices. You know, uh, we lack visibility. Things are covert, unobtrusive. Uh, they are black boxes. They are non-disclosed instead of disclosed. They are not transparent instead of transparent. They are, um, are lacking in our consent, perhaps. But Raphael, how do we respond as a people, as a society, as a, as a world to complexity? What are some of your ideas about how we, we face this challenge that we've created ourselves almost? We, we are responsible for this challenge, but now how do we respond to this challenge that we've created for ourselves? Mm. Uh, I, I answer you as a philosopher, if I may. Please. Uh, this is a question of, uh, of truth. 
and freedom, but of course of truth in society. And what I've learned from last century discussions on uh, uh, theory of science, uh, particularly the questions uh, stated by Karl Popper, was that um, that we don't have a scientist uh, an absolute basis for science. That science is, is something that can always be questioned and uh, and uh, falsified, as he said. So, you no, know, the verification of, uh, of results makes uh, something absolute and universal, but the possibility of, of questioning it and falsifying it. You did you say the word falsifying in English? Or yes, 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 yes. Okay. okay. So it was a uh, it was a, a, a big challenge for traditional uh, science of the ninth coming from the nineteenth century uh, from positivism, with the idea there is the truth, it's just a kind of a substitute from religious truth and for scientific truth. The positivists of the nineteenth century were believed strongly in this kind of scientific truth, and this made the scientists free. Uh, so this revolution, so. Uh, an analogy, if we can manage to, to do similar things, but with caution uh, in uh, the uh, arena of um, uh, social communication. Of course, behind this, I saw discussion about fake news and so on. I don't want to go in this direction now, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it is uh, a symptom uh, that uh, in our, in our um, complex world, uh, we have in some way to see uh, some kind, I use this word with a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, relative, not relativism, but some kind of uh, uh, caution uh, when, uh, when stating uh, something as being uh, absolutely true or, 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 or no, no question of relativizing this. And, uh, this is difficult for democratic societies to do this because the limits of the democratic societies are given by, by specific laws uh, and how to deal also um, socially and personally because um, not everybody has the strength and the capacity to live without uh, uh, some kind of fixed point in your life, uh, some kind of absolute, religious of whatever kind. Uh, we all have our dark sides or hidden hidden aspects of our lives and so on. So um, Heidegger used the word of aletheia, which means there's something is discovered, but also closed or, or hidden. Uh, so this is a concept, and it's not really a concept of truth, it's a concept of existential living, uh, that I'm, I'm not uh, completely, um, how could I say, uh, transparent to myself, yeah, uh, myself, which is Freud, of course, yeah? and uh, then consciousness and so on. Uh, also the body is, uh, it, is something uh, that I cannot uh, understand completely and of course the medical doctors cannot understand the body also completely so they have always the problems and so at a social level we we, we have some ways of doing doing with that uh, in some way in the medical in the medical field in the political fields uh, but uh, there is just some some tendencies in the other way to just to to get very strong on, on a truth and becomes a political ideology or, or fanaticism and so on. And this is why I think the uh, uh, philosophical issues are important for, for every life, also for these kind of issues. If we manage to, uh, what scientists did with their own science, uh, with their own view of science, to question their basis, uh, this was a fantastic uh, advance of science in my view. Can we do something similar in societies, uh, also with the idea of democracy and communication in the digital age? How would this look like um, without coming into chaos, into fake news, into uh, you know uh, make America strong again or whatever, uh, which is absurd, of course, uh, because we have to make uh, other people stronger uh, because they are very weak. 
So he just changed the word, make weaker people strong again. That would be a nice, a nice uh, uh, word for, for President of the United States. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, I think this is the, the issue that we face now. And because IT is so strong uh, and, uh, and people want to be strong, because they are weak. Normally we will say, why I want to be strong. Why do you want to be strong? Because you're weak. Uh, this is why you're looking for, for power. Uh, uh, but uh, it, there are different ways of dealing with the weaker. And this is, I think, something we, we should promote in our world. Turn our use towards the weaker uh, and uh, whatever kind of children or, or, or disabled or whatever. Uh, minorities, whatever kind, if we manage to create an atmosphere worldwide uh, that we are all, all of us working together to help the weak, maybe maybe we could we could change a little bit a better world. But it is now now become a little bit uh, too uh, almost almost uh, uh, too religious when I say that. I don't want to become a religious guru about this. It's just uh, very simple. Just trying to say what I see. That is really beautiful. Um, and you hear this now in value sensitive design in systems theory and uh, socio technical systems design, where people are talking about care by design, especially in robotics, when you're talking about social robotics, for example. And so, what you've said to me is the pinnacle, I think, of where society should be striving. Uh, that's my personal interpretation, anyhow. But I wanted to ask you, dovetailing on this beautiful, summation before we go to question time what are your thoughts as a scholar on transdisciplinarity and do we need it uh, why is it important if you think we need it and how does it look to you when we talk about transdisciplinarity <clears throat> my experience in brussels was uh, a very good experience in transdisciplinarity so we had we were 12 people uh, different uh, uh, specialities and biologists and lawyers, philosophers, and so on and so on. And we were dealing with one problem. Uh, so transdisciplinarity means uh, everybody's looking at one issue that, that we are dealing with and with one problem. Uh, it's less, less a question of the disciplines as such, which is discipline, where are you looking at when you are doing interdisciplinary research and transdisciplinary research. And it was at that time in this small group with only 12 people, very interesting, because it was a problem of translation, uh, not only because we were 12 people with different languages in Europe, uh, but also speaking some of them Italian and French or German or whatever, and whatever, and trying to speak in English with, uh, with uh, automatic translation, not automatic, uh, uh, translation uh, at the same time we spoke into English or French or French. Uh, so and uh, and also uh, because of the of the issues, uh, I learned a lot, a lot in these years about biology. Uh, incredible! I had no, no idea at the, at the beginning uh, how much I didn't know about all these issues, particularly stem cells. But at first opinion, it was extremely difficult. We took one year and a half uh, to just to, to write down what we wanted to say. Is it possible to, to uh, have a, a, a utilitarian perspective on stem cells, yes or no? You know, these questions, yes or no, are very tricky because there are many, many, if you put a question, yes or no, it is the wrong question normally. Yeah? Uh, it depends on the context, it depends on what, for what and so on and so on. And so, um, uh, so we had uh, wonderful people like uh, Anne McLaren, who's one of the most important exper experts in, uh, uh, from the UK uh, in, uh, in stem cells. Uh, and we had uh, lawyers and so on and so on. So everybody was uh, talking about this from his or her own perspective. And we got to, to put all these views into an opinion and make some suggestions for the, for the, for the European community, uh, for, the, well, for the European, uh, uh, for the president of the European Commission. Uh, and one interesting, interesting thing was that it was possible that if you are not, uh, you do not agree with the result of the opinion, 
uh, it was possible to put uh, uh, a caveat from one of the persons and said, I don't agree. Uh, in this case, it was really one person who didn't agree because we were a liberal, liberal group and we said, well, depending on that, it's a little bit sophisticated what we wrote at that time. You can read it a little bit later. And one of them said, not at all. And so this was uh, put inside too. So that uh, we were not deciding instead of the politicians, we gave in to the president of the European commissions and to the parliament and said, okay, you have to decide, not we. We just investigate these issues and we open different kinds of possibilities, but the decisions should be taken at the parliament, not at the, at the ethics group. And this separation uh, was very, very important. I think this is for, for a transdisciplinarity group very important, just to analyze uh, different views. Let some people say, I don't agree at all with that. I want to state clearly that I not agree and then present it to the people who have to take the decisions. Yeah, this is, I think, the, the issue I, I, I would promote in the polit politics and science. Raphael, uh, I want to let the audience know you've worked in Asia uh, on robotics themes and uh, for different visiting uh, universities all over the world. Uh, you've done the project on ethic bots and Ethica. Uh, you're, with the EIC of the founding EIC for so many decades of the International Review of Information Ethics, which now has been wonderfully uh, hosted and taken by Jared Bilby, who's online for those who uh, don't know Jared, we'll introduce him in a moment. But there's so much that you've contributed and I know you'll keep writing. Um, I'm cognizant of time ticking and I want the audience to be able to ask you direct questions. So I'm gonna stop personally and invite from the floor, but from me, Raphael, thank you for your incredible contributions to us, which we desperately need in this time and day and age. Uh, I know you're a lover of books and so am I, uh, but I encourage everyone as I put items in the chat to access your documents online. You've got your PowerPoints on your website. You've got PDFs galore. Uh, you really have opened up the knowledge that you've assisted with others to create and I appreciate that so much but I just want to thank you from me to you from the school to you uh, from the center to you for coming online today.